almost live. I know that we're trickling in. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Wonderful. Well, welcome. We are officially live on YouTube and Zoom, and I know that folks are still trickling into Zoom and likely our live stream. Um, this is Filipino American Gathering Places in Seattle, part two. My name is Taylor, and I'm the community events manager here at Historic Seattle. And today I am live from Historic Seattle's home in First Hill, the Dearborn House. And I've got guests here, and you'll meet them in just a second. Um, but our mission at Historic Seattle is saving meaningful places to foster lively communities. And Historic Seattle knows that our programs and our properties occupy the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. The acknowledgement is not a substitute for developing relationships with indigenous communities or for honoring indigenous stories as we share our collective history. But it's the first step in recognizing the people whose land we do occupy. So I've got a few thank yous before I introduce all of the guests who are here with us today. First, I'd like to thank our sponsors for making our education programming possible. So thank you to Bricklayers and Allied Craft, Wires, lo craft Workers, Local One, Washington and Alaska. Thanks to Daniel's Real Estate, the Greystone and the Lodge at St. Edward Park. And thank you to Selen Construction. And I've got a special thank you today, our co-presenter of today's program, um, the Filipino American National Historical Society. Thank you so much for partnering with us for part two. Um, October, is Filipino American History Month. And it's our honor to present this program with the support of the Filipino American National Historical Society. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists and our ASL interpreter, Ellen, for being, uh, thank you, Ellen, who's, who's here and also is a pin, is one of the pinned speakers in Zoom if you're tuning in in Zoom. So today, we are, have our full roster back with us from the May part one of today's program. So we've got Dorothy and I'll go ahead and switch so that you can see our lovely panelists. We've got some interesting tech happening, so bear with me. <laughs> well, I work some magic and switch the screen. <laughs> all right, so you all are now, the screen is on the three of you, so you can go ahead and wave <laughs> to everyone. Hi. Um, so we've got Dorothy with us and Dor <laughs> I know, so funny. Uh, Dorothy is the founder and executive director of the Filipino American National Historical Society. We've got Pio Decano uh, the second. Pio is an extensive educational and professional back, has an extensive educational and professional background as a teacher, administrator, consultant, community activist, activist and volunteer. Pio has done everything. Actually, all three all the things. And finally, we've got Cynthia. Um, scrolling through my notes way too fast. Our last speaker is Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia, thank you so much for making parts one and two happen. If you didn't make it to part one of this program, Cynthia reached out to Historic, Historical Seattle and said, hey, you all should um, do some programming around Filipino American history in Seattle. And we said yes to part one and yes to part two. So thank you so much, Cynthia, for making this happen. Um, Cynthia is a retired Seattle Public Schools teacher and a sign language interpreter. And Cynthia is also the reason that we have Ellen with us today. So thank you so, so much. And with that, we are going to dive kind of right in. We've got, I think, a total of eight sites that we're covering today. Last time we did five, so we're going to really breeze through it. We'll do um, some Q&A at the end. And I definitely want you all to put your questions in the chat throughout the presentation, and we will try to get through as many of them as we can before our time is up at seven. Um, and a reminder, like we say at all of our programs, please keep in mind that our points of view differ, and that's okay. We love that here, and we just want everyone in the space to be respectful um, and listen and learn and explore with an open mind. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Pio, Cynthia, and Dorothy. And I'm gonna switch the mic so that you can hear them. Yeah, I, you're showing a sign that says positively no Filipinos allowed. Uh, actually, that's not in Seattle. That's uh, a, a photo that was taken in Stockton, California, uh, which was um, what we referred to as the Mecca of Filipino American life during the 20s, 30s, 40s, 
probably into the 50s. And those signs were there. We actually looked for another sign that said, uh, no Filipinos or dogs allowed. So that shows you how far down we were in the pecking order of humanity. I, th and, um, I think the reason why I wanted to show this slide, and Manong Pyu here has an actual poster of it, was because, you know, some of us grew up seeing those kinds of signs. But here tonight, we're talking about historic Filipino gathering places because we saw signs like this, that we were able to get together, socialize, you know, meet each other, support each other, uh, whether it be, you know, through labor, through work, through, you know, farming, through gambling, to dancing, and organizations. So I thought that was a very important, uh, you know, sign to start out with as we go into our, our talk today. Yeah. Oh, oh, the Liberty Barbershop. The Liberty Barbershop was a meeting place uh, where the early Filipino arrivals, Manongs, from especially Ilocanos, <laughs> from uh, uh, my dad's hometown, Santa Maria, uh, Ilocosur, and uh, they would go in there and share their, what had been going on in their lives. And most of the individuals that would go to the Liberty Barbershop were uh, workers, uh, waiters, dishwashers, farm workers, but they had the commonality of speaking Ilocano and also of looking good. Mm. And, and, <laughs> and that was really important. I was brought up you know, this is 60, 70, 75 years ago that I had to get a haircut every week, every week. And it progressed, as I noticed as I was getting older, it progressed to when I'd go into the barbershop and the older Filipino monongs would have the hair in their ears cut with the snippers by Flo Della. Mm -hmm. And Florencio was the owner of Liberty Barbershop, mm -hmm. and he would uh, he would also he would also house uh, a lot of the uh, he had a second story or second loft in his barbershop, mm -hmm. and he housed a lot of old Ilocanos who couldn't find housing any other place because of the restrictive housing that they faced. But at any rate, the Liberty Barbershop was a meeting place where they shared the hometown experiences and their experiences here. And uh, it helped a lot, helped a lot to build a camaraderie among that generation. Yeah. Was it that, uh, I, I think we should also add that there was more than one barber shop. Mm -hmm. There were barber shops that catered to the different dialects that people That's came right, from yeah. different parts of the Philippines. So there was something for the Tagalogs, the Visayans, you know, whatever, uh, because they felt comfortable speaking in the language of their heart, and which was their native language. Mm -hmm. And there was also another place that we didn't think of. It was a bathhouse. And um, mm -hmm. that was totally Visayan. But I guess, I never went in there, but we used to go by there and peek in. And it, that's where the men bathed. They could take a warm shower. And, uh, but there was also in the back room a place where they played cards. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about the barbershops, if they played cards there too, but I know it was a hangout for the men, a place they felt comfortable. You know, right down there across the street from Liberty yeah. was the Honey Court Seafood, but it was also the location of the Filipino Social and Improvement Club. Clint, yeah. <laughs> in that same building that right, night. Right. Five, Across five the club. street, yeah. It was a gambling joint yeah. owned by Rudy Santos. That's right. right. And and it was a gathering place because Ru Uncle Rudy would do this. In the morning he would bring in coffee and donuts. Yeah. And then at night he would have um, chop suey delivered. Mm. So even though the men may lose there, though they would think they would could uh, win, mm -hmm. uh, he provided for them. And it was, they, they hang, a lot of the guys thought they were going to win, but there was mostly another gathering place because there weren't, you know why? There weren't too many places we were welcome. That's right. 
That's right. You, you in that same uh, building, you go down steps to the gambling joint. Yeah. And right on the outside, it said, or up up above, in the doorway, it would say Filipino Social and Improvement, and improvement Club. Club. Right. <laughs> you go down the steps. Uh -huh. It's long steps, and you There's knock on the door. <laughs> knock on the door and you could hear the noise of the gambling inside the high q game going and the oh for christ's sake and the <laughs> dice rolling uh -huh. and they open up then the they'd door. slide the door, the door. Yeah. And yes and i'd say it's it's my uncle is is my uncle Bio in here and or uncle joe or, or whoever <laughs> you know was, yeah what what years are we talking about oh um, for me you're talking about when i was 16 15 yeah, uh, you know, maybe I, uh, sixty years ago. Sixty. Well, yeah. I was I was going there when I was in college because I call Uncle Rudy up and I say, <laughs> I say, hey, we're having something at Seattle University. We need some money, and uh, he would say, just come on down. So we go there, knock on the door, and that little uh, uh, slide, that door yeah. would slide open, and I'd say. Um, Uncle Rudy said that we could come here and get some money. And I remember walking in, I could see my uncles ducking underneath the table. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, the thing that got me is the guy opening up the door always had a gun under his arm. Yep. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just one thing about barber shops, um, if I may put this in. Yeah. Uh, there is a barber shop chair. There's a barber chair. Yeah. At yes. The Wing Luke Museum. You know where that came from? Say, it came from uh, Liberty. Uh, yeah. es Espanol, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go see an actual barber right. I saw stool, <laughs> right? Chair. Yeah. It's at the Wing Luke. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, the Filipino men really wanted to look good. My mom time. decried those places. Oh, she said they were going to be the ruin of the Fili ruin the Filipino families. Well, I thought the ruin of the yeah. Filipino guys would have been the dance halls, the Dama dance halls. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Well, dance, now we're dance. going... <laughs> no, not, not Washington Hall, but the other place where the casino yeah. was. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. So now we move on to Tai Tung Restaurant, and my story is... You, that's where you went, Chinatown. You yeah. didn't call it... You didn't call it the International yeah. District, no, it, was it was Chinatown. Chinatown. I still call it Chinatown. And what we would do is we would go to Wasang, Wasong is, if you look at your walk, picture yeah. on the left side where the truck yeah. is, uh -huh. that Wasong was where we would get our bogong, we would get our, oh, you know, God, our yeah. spices, we would get the chinchon, yeah. uh -huh. and I think her name was Florence. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they were, they really cared to the Filipinos because the other place we would get Filipino food was up in Vancouver, right? We'd have to cross the border to go to Chinatown well, to get some of our, had, yeah, well, some so that's why she had, and, but anyway, after that we would go to Tai Tung and eat. And, mm -hmm. and you know something about, else about the Tai Tung, right next door, the next, the chicken house. There. Yes, it no, was it a, was right on the, it was on the sidewalk. And you could, there you could go in and choose the chicken you there wanted. Were, to, you there wanted were live to, chickens outside. That's right. You could yeah. go in there. You could right. go in there and say, I want that one. <laughs> I want that one. And they get it out, butcher chicken, and you'd get the fresh chicken right there. You know, there. you remember what kind of chickens there were? Because when they would boil it for stew, there was little bits of eggs in there. Yeah. You know? I mean, they weren't the eggs in the shell. <laughs> and we would fight over who got, you got oh, it the last yeah. time. No, this one. The Titan. Oh, so man. it was uh, in 1946 when the VFW, the post mm -hmm. 6599, which yeah. is a, a Filipino post, I heard at some point, because we're VFW people, that that was Mariano, Jean uh, Del Rosario, Mariano Angeles, all those folks had were meeting at the Titan. Mm -hmm. And that's where they, they started talking about forming a VFW. Oh. organization and that was you know Tai Tung everybody ate there and oh, they still did. serve Filipino dishes right. mm -hmm. well they were the only Chinese restaurant that had Filipino food mm -hmm. and and that was they even had batoka oh yeah yeah, yeah. The I mean, like, uh, yeah. which is yeah. the Filipino was stomach, that, right? Right? Yeah. 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 stomach right yeah stomach yeah. <laughs> and, and that's because, I, mean, I, I don't even think Filipino restaurants have bituca. P i t u c a. Bituca, yes, yeah. I, Frenchy. That's yeah, I mean. it but was thing, it was on the edge of high tech also because yeah. you could put a dot. You, they'd have these uh, little machines up there that you could 
that were right on the wall. You could oh, put a music. dime in, yeah. put a dime in and press the music that you wanted, right. and it would play. And that was super high tech back then. <laughs> you put a dime in, you, you know, you flip it, you see, oh, there's Patty Page. Yeah, you know, it was just incredible. But, but uh, I remember when Dan Sarasal was president of the Filipino community, he was really a good sport and very generous. He had his meetings. Uh -huh. the that's right. There was no that's right. community center. Yeah. There. It was either at Arsenal or with Uncle Dan, it was at Tai Tung. And we would eat at his, we were his guests while we conducted business. And even today we still, in fact, we're going to be eating some great food from there today. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Historic Seattle. But I'm just wondering, do we have a date on Tai Tung Restaurant? I didn't write it down, I just talked about memories. They went to the 30s. Yeah, 1930s. So, go go to Tai Tung Restaurant. You know, it's, Filipino yeah, vibes yeah, there. Yeah, my dad, uh, my uncle lived to uh, 100. Uncle mm -hmm. Joe Mariola, mm -hmm. and he would go down there, walk down there, and uh, take the bus, and then walk down there, and uh, he uh, he would went in there well into his 90s. And he, like I say, he passed when he was 100. Mm -hmm. But he, that's where you'd go, go look through the window, and be, there'd be Uncle Joe sitting in there at his favorite restaurant. Mm -hmm. And uh, he lived his entire life in, in, in Seattle. Yeah. They would remember what you want when Fred would walk in. Mm -hmm. They would almost prepare his food mm. because yeah. he went there so often. Mm -hmm. When I'd go to meetings, he'd go down and sit at the counter. And that was one of the places that had a counter. Yes. Yeah, the rest of them were all booths, but Tai Tung had a counter. So, uh, let's see, I, oh, this is where you, Manong, ILWU, yeah. Local 37, which is something we did in part one, but because Auntie said it was such a big gathering place that it we're going was. to feature it again. When we were discussing it, we were only talking at first about places we'd go to on weekends, you know, or uh, later on the community was more than that. Mm -hmm. But uh, Trinidad Rojo was president of the union at that time. And in his oral history, he said that he purchased that building for the union. Oh, and at that time it had three floors. But he said then there was a fire and um, it was gone. I mean, they never did rebuild the, oh. the top floor. It was a gathering place. Now, Pio was there getting work to go to, I mean, getting Dispatched. Dispatched. Yeah. yeah, but I, I, I visited, I visited there quite a bit. Uh, my family legacy goes back to my father's contribution to, although this was going to help him financially, uh, paying for the union dues for Local 37. Now you've got to remember it was I L W U Local th Local 37 International. Warehouse Union and uh, Local 37. They included that Local 37 as part of that larger organization. But uh, yes, it was it was a hotbed of a political and socioeconomic uh, place where the old Manongs would meet, and uh, and in some cases there would be, there would be payoffs to get off to a uh, payoffs to you get know, a job in Alaska. For the season, but we always refer to them as the old monos. But they started out as young Adings. Yes, they were you're young. Right. You're so right. those guys were coming at sixteen, seventeen to this country, That's and right. they were going to Alaska when they were teenagers That's or just right. twenties. They became old, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So and, and a lot of you guys going to elderly. college. That's how my brothers and my husband earned money for tuition. I get, I get, yeah. I get paid at my dad's office. They'd hand me. A year's tuition, and I paid yeah, for. Yeah, right. I just I pay for. I go out to the U Dub and just give them the, the my season's wages. Yeah, and and that would be it. But didn't they also put in money for like the building of the Filipino community? No, you got sector? your you got your wages at the end of the season. At the end of the no, season. But I mean, did they right. donate some of that money to for the building no, of the FCS? I don't think so. No, no? they didn't. No, they they didn't. earned it. They well, I know. Yeah. And, and you know, and it wasn't just West Coast Filipinos. We had the Filipino Student Bulletin, which was uh, published in New York. And one of the things that I saw, and one of the things that
It was called the call of the uh, of the salmon, uh, no, the call of the pinks or the, the silver. That's it. And I couldn't figure it out till we read it. They were telling the the uh, students, Filipino students in universities throughout the country, that the call of the silver was the silver salmon up mm -hmm. and and they could go to Seattle and get a job that would earn them money mm. uh, for tuition and probably for some of their living expenses, mm. to, as long as they didn't gamble. Mm. I mean, right. that was the caveat, so, you know. The but, Filipino Community Center, remember, was a, a bowling alley, renovated bowling mm -hmm. alley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know how much the initial cost was. So. Yeah, well, now that building is empty. Yeah. Washington Hall. This is a. I thought this was a great segment of photos. <laughs> I really yeah, like right. They right. all came. A lot of them came from you in historic Seattle, yeah. landmark building, right? Yeah, you. Yeah. It was. Um, you know, we were there so often as Filipinos that a lot of the old, <laughs> they honestly thought that was our place, yeah. and. Um, yeah, we had dances. That's the way the dances were. And if yeah. you look, that's a great shot. It's a mixed. The it's a interracial group. And, uh, Mixed ethnic group. Yeah. We had more bands. Oh, God. Live bands. You know, there was right. a different band every week. And sometimes the bands, the members would overlap. But uh, there was a balcony. You remember and Johnny? The kids, I yeah, know. About, you know so <laughs> yes. my, my, that's oh, when, the when the parents, they didn't have babysitters. Yeah, that's right. They'd bring the kids. That's I right. was one of them running around upstairs <laughs> getting in trouble. Oh, that's God. how you met oh, people. All, if you, yeah. yeah, the people my age, they all remember right. getting in trouble. Stop yeah, that noise up there and running the kids, around. Yeah, <laughs> the balcony was their place. <laughs> and, and, and imagine some of those musicians there mm. belong to the Black Musicians Union. Yeah, well, that's because true. they could they could not because uh, unions were segregated. Yeah, and the, the Johnny O'Francia. Uh -huh. uh, it was one I can remember right offhand. Mm -hmm. Sonny Martos, same way. Saxophone players, good saxophone players, tried to join the union. They said, "No, you go they to the had, black they union." Yeah, they joined. Yeah, yeah. And there were a lot of Filipino musicians. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was one interesting about the dances, though, is uh, the dances started at eight o'clock and went till midnight. But right before midnight, the band, any band, would always play "Good Night Sweetheart." Uh -huh. So we knew, <laughs> we knew it was the end of the dance when they would play "Good Night Sweetheart." And yeah. you know what? They open up ceremonies at Washington Hall. Yeah, that's right. That was the national anthem. Yeah, national anthem. That's right. That's what they'd open those. They, they need then and that would yeah. be mm -hmm. Christmas party for the Filipino Community Center or the Filipino community because we had no place right and um, so apparently they're watching a movie because mm. <sighs> uh, and Washington Hall I'm glad you know it's still yeah there. all the drop-in center I know you're yeah. gonna start out with my slide no are you gonna have that there you go yeah, that's the one on Willer. So the one on the right was, according to Auntie, was the second site. And I worked there uh -huh. in 1976. Wow. And so I'm in the middle there. You can probably see me behind, right next to the guy with sunglasses. And these were the men. Uh, the ones on the two on the right are Chinese. Okay. And uh, the, of course, the ones on the right are my monongs. And some of you might recognize them. Uh, there's Alma Seagut, these are all Alice Garrow, yeah. Sam Figueroa, mm -hmm. uh, Sammy Lopez. Uh, I was a community outreach worker and I would uh, visit them in their hotels to make sure they were still alive, mm -hmm. to see if they needed help to get to the hospital. I would accompany them and, and, if, and so this was uh, again 610 South Weller yeah. and then right on the right, the IDIC, this is a church right, the Methodist Church on, on Beacon Hill, and mm -hmm, I, this is mm -hmm. the fourth site. And they were downstairs. And, and uh, <clears throat> when all the monongs, our elderly, passed on, uh, we, the IDIC kind of changed its mission. It was always a social service agency to help low-income folks. And then mm -hmm. we got the, the families from the Philippines, the immigrant families who needed help and support. And then we got into uh, serving the Filipino 
veterans of World War II who came here to, to get their money, to try to get money yeah. from their service, mm -hmm. which they were denied. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, was, it was social, it was very communal, you know, a lot of people spoke their languages, they served food, they gave uh, nutrition assistance, and um, we had nurses when we were there. Two nurses would check blood pressure and, you know, just, just look at them and make sure they were doing well. Uh, it, it, was, it was very profound. Now, again, here are the Monongs, they're celebrating my 24th birthday. Again, <laughs> so Pantal Tawena is right next on my left. The director is uh, next to my, my, my mother, next to me, and then Ben Rafanan. He was a director when I was there. Rosalina Mendoza, again mm -hmm. to the left. Nurse Margie Gamble was a, not Margie Gamble, but Gabrielle was uh, like a social worker. Uh, that's Rosalie Mendoza, and that's the legal day. That's Rosalie and, Mendoza. And, and, yeah, Rosalina Mendoza, <laughs> Auntie Rosalina yeah. Mendoza, Frank Descar. I'm just naming Toribio Martin, Bob Ursia, Pablo Soria, Alma Sigat, and Magno Rudio, who end up marrying one of the. She was a servant in one of the council generals' yeah. household, and he ended up marrying one of them because the ones they were going to be sent that away. That were sent yeah. back to the mm -hmm. Philippines. But I'll tell you one thing. This is my story. They fell in love with me. I was their daughter. I was their their little sister. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I was their niece. I was Indai. Indai is, I think, the Cyan word little sister and when I went to the Philippines I went to the Philippines in December of 76 they got a van and they they sent me off and one thing several of them came up to me and they said Cynthia this is the address of my sister oh. can you visit her and here's some money <laughs> Start <crying. laughs> please yeah. please please get some cigarettes yeah. give them Oh. Or, or give them this money or give them this letter. And that's how you're wondering how I traveled all over the Philippine Islands. I was going up north you and were, I was you going were doing to this. That, I did right. that in 76. Oh, that. So in, because they were, you know, it was like because they had adopted me. Yeah. yeah. And I knew yeah. the connection. They, they, they were sending all their, their good vibes and their prayers mm. and mm. good wishes because a lot of them died here. They yeah. never went home. Yeah. They never went back. That's right. So I, I did that. Now, this is part of the Young Once Choir. They're yeah. always performing at different festivals. And this is part of the new IDIC. Auntie Dolly in the right front in the row, middle, right. third from uh, the right. Mm -hmm. uh, again, getting people together, mm -hmm. social, learning uh, just camaraderie and feeling proud of being Filipino. Mm -hmm. Is that Dolly Castillo? That's Dolly Jesus. in the black, the black. She's oh, the, the third from the right or the left. I don't know. How would you do that? But, yes. Yeah, from the right. And uh, the widows of old timers. Yes, that's yeah. true. And like uh, we were saying, yeah. they came over here right. to to get some money back from the from the U.S. government. No, but a lot of them the old time. there. A lot of them were the widows of the real old timers. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> These are the Filipino war veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, again, their cause is very strong uh, to, to get you know recognition and money uh, from the, the government again. Uh, and uh, they are also um, people who go to the IDIC. Mm -hmm. uh, the Filipino community. Filipino, yes. they finally, well, this is a story. Uh, Actually, the whole concept of the Filipino Community Center started with Filipino students at the UW. And um, they needed a place where they would feel welcome. And so in the late 20s, the whole concept of having a community center came up and they approached businessmen. And among the businessmen they asked for funds was uh, Pio's father, my dad, and uh, several others who gave the money, most of the money. There were others who mm -hmm. gave money mm -hmm. eventually, but that was right before the Great Depression. And um, so your dad then, Pio, put money into a bank account, apparently, yes. which was there, right. And uh, over the years, 
um, from 19, from the late 1920s, around 28, 29, when the money was put in the bank, until the time that the community finally was mm, purchased, mm. 65. That's a long time. That's what, 35, 36 years. So money was raised for the purchase of the building on the, is this the left? Mm -hmm. um, the Bully uh, Yeah, it was, it took that time, and the money was raised basically through queen contests. Oh, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna get into that right the next. No, time. And this is before oh, your mother. Right. Yeah, 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 it was. Right. It well, was Andy, not Andy, you gonna talk oh, about you? It wasn't. It wasn't the misses yet. It was all the oh, misses. Oh, all of us young girls <laughs> whose parents said you will run for queen of the community, and we thought, oh, good God, we got to do those things. See that Burgess Lodge number ten yeah, under there? Yeah, that's the, Lodge, that's a. Um, Burgess Lodge, and they're having one of their national conventions uh -huh. up there. But that's at the community. But they didn't, the money was raised by nickel and diming it. And um, it was amazing. It took 35 years to put the down payment on the place. But once they got the community, they used it all the time. Mm -hmm. And they paid yes. off the rest of it with bingo parties every single Sunday and renting the place out. So people switched away from Washington Hall gradually mm -hmm. and basically went over and had things at the community. Not everybody. A lot of people still stayed at Washington Hall. Or the new people then start, started to go to hotels. So, but this is a de Salon thing. So then um, the Filipino community was, uh, it was a hub for events. Mm -hmm. uh, different regional organizations, mm -hmm. military, social organizations, and Auntie was talking about contests, the, the beauty contests. Yeah, so there we go. Beauty contests, <laughs> no. Uh, the, the money raised in selling tickets was to help support the community of Seattle, Filipino community of Seattle. And the reason why I am paying tribute to the Philippine War Brides is they were the ambassadors. They helped uh, raise, as you can see, a lot of money for the community. These women, this started in 1949, and several women in this group became Mrs. Filipino Community of Seattle, <laughs> raised a lot of money. Uh, and uh, we just, my mother's on the front row on the right. Um, we lost um, Auntie, uh, Fanny. Auntie Fanny Sumawang, mm -hmm. front row on the left very recently one of the four women who came here in uh, the late 40s there were visayan women mm -hmm. and their husbands were ilocano yeah and the reason why the war brides were uh formed was that uh uncle angelus mariano angelus wanted his wife to meet other people mm -hmm. from the visayan area and that's and so they met and it grew very and very important again ambassadors they worked at the mohai remember when mohai mm -hmm. they do the mm -hmm. christmas club mm -hmm. they would uh roll lumpia they'd sell lumpia they did a lot of things they yeah. brought in a lot of actually officers they were elected to the community council right, right. and yes. they held office i mean some of them became officers yeah. like secretary or well, you know, my board, mom, mem board, board members. Yeah. Yes. As far as I'm able to ascertain, my mom was the first female mm -hmm. to be uh, the chair of the clubhouse directors. Oh. And that was the, uh, real. I think I've shared this with yeah. you, that she, she wanted a brand new club. How she thought that buying the used bowling alley was beneath <laughs> no. the Filipino community. That's what her uh, position was. But that's uh, all we could afford. <laughs> that's right. But she 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 went ahead and, and contracted an architect to draw plans oh, no. for a new center. But uh, I, I think a little bit of fee, uh, uh, Filipino male chauvinism uh pre prevented that from oh. from ever taking place so well I remember, now this is hindsight from uh you know well watching. there's a yeah. there's a story do you remember gene del rosario yes oh yeah okay gene was um he, he was the bowler and he claims yeah. 
that he's the bull there and he found out that he's <laughs> all okay. So we went to tell the people who were in charge of the community thing, saying there's a place for sale, mm. and but you have to do it now, I guess. And I, apparently, I don't know how much they, they spent for it, but... I think it was uh, on the first slide. Yeah, so that's what one reason. I'm so sorry your mother didn't get her dream, but... But it's yeah, still being yeah. used. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's still being used. Yeah. It says so, 50, 60, right. my glasses, $60,000. And that was it being remodeled. Yeah, that's it oh, now. They got the new. Right. They got the new Filipino village there. Yes, yeah. they do. Yeah. Which is the uh, low-income housing, senior housing. Yeah. Um, and now, because of COVID, there haven't been any events there. Mm -hmm. the, they do have the uh, Bataan Corregidor mm -hmm. Survivors Association Museum in the back. Yeah. But now, what they've done is they have used the space to provide. Uh, Fam meals oh, and good. food bank items to our Filipino community members, and they they uh, deliver on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And uh, I mean, it's a good use of the space yeah. because you can see they've got a lot of people who donate to this, mm -hmm. and they spread mm -hmm. that out to the community. Mm -hmm. So you know, kudos for them. Just a heads up. Yeah. Uh, I ran into. I stopped by the community center uh, about a couple of months ago. And the fellow that was doing the mural, oh yes, on the Eliseo. Museum, Eliseo. 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 Yeah. Eliseo. Uh -huh. yeah. And I told him who I was, and he says, "Oh, I got. I th you, your family is your family uh, is here, right here." And somehow he had found a a photo of, your dad. of my my dad, my and mom, mom, and my brother who was sitting on my dad's lap, and me is about a six-month-old infant mm. sitting on yeah. my mom's lap mm. and I, I I said geez where'd you get that she says and he says I thought you were a little girl because I was in my baptismal <laughs> dress oh. <laughs> eight years ago <laughs> I'm not oh my, oh my god so it those of you who want to ago. see this mural uh, go to 5740 Martin Luther King Way. It's right behind. Is he finished? He was supposed to be. He was supposed right, to be finished, right, yeah. Right behind the Filipino Community Center, there is a big mural. Yeah, I heard it was there, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to see it. It's really cool. Oh, it is. It, it is, is fantastic. Well done. It's, it, yes, it's incredible. It well, he's a muralist. I mean, oh, yeah. he's, yeah. he has his murals painted okay. all over the country. Here we go with Dr. Jose yeah. Rizal. Park, which is you know the best place. I mean, if you haven't been to Rizal Park, look at yeah. this view. Yeah, look at this That's view. That's incredible. And yeah. I had friends that they took pictures from uh, oh, Rizal yeah. Park when yeah. the kingdom was imploded. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that is the <laughs> That's the kingdom yeah, right there. Kingdom. Right. I think this is eighty five. Yeah. Was when this was the this is Wasn't a, there? Were they? Were they were going to try and get rid of Rizal Park because of the the kingdom or an expansion of some sort? No, I don't know, but were you there when we were planting trees down below? Oh yes, my kids were there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. Well, we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, <laughs> they had this wonderful plan and was designed by an architect who does gardens. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Were, taught, were part of this group, yeah. and it said, these are the children of, you know, the Romaldez family. And Michael, I'm not, that's not, that's me, but that's not my name. So that's how I remember that. This is Dr. Jose Rizal. Yeah, and He's the national him. hero of mm -hmm. the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that there was a group, the uh, Rizal Park, you know, society that really wanted to get this uh, piece of territory and also name a bridge. So they, they actually approached Mayor Wes Ullman. It was kind of weird. I was reading about this. In 1973, right. Trinidad right. Rojo he again really shows up. up. Yeah. The Rizal Society in 1960. He suggests to Wes Ullman in 73 that he should, Ullman should commit the name <laughs> of a street and the Filipinos would support his re-election. <laughs> so, in, in, we got more than a street, we got a bridge, that, that's and a, we got a park. And Trinidad is the same one who bought the uh, local 37 building. He was very influential. He was, very, he was much in, into a lot of stuff.
But, you know, that, that's a, this is really interesting because Jose Rizal was the name of the lodge. It's the Jose yeah. Rizal, uh, the Burgess Lodge. Yeah. And that's a, it's a throwback to Roman times, Masons. Well, Ooh, Rizal you was, know. you figure, uh, when the Philippines became part of the United States, uh, of course, the people fighting against the United States was Aguinaldo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they wouldn't... And he, Ricardi. He, he, yeah, and they could not be the heroes under the United States. So what the U.S. did is they, they pushed the fact that Rizal was now the big hero for Filipinos. But he's, and when I was a kid, mm. every December 30th, was Rizal right, Day, right. and we celebrated. It was a big event yes. in the communities, not not uh, New Year's Eve, but Rizal Day. They would have, they would do my last farewell done by, uh, you uh -huh. know, it was all uh -huh. these different things. That's right. And uh, yeah. it stopped though. Uh, by the by, around the sixties, we no longer had Rizal Day celebration. Well, that's Rizal was executed. Rizal yeah, he was, was executed yeah. by yeah. firing squad yeah, by the Spaniards right. in eighteen ninety six. Yep. Yeah. And he was a medical doctor. He was. He was part of. He, he was, was upper. He was man. upper class. He was. Did he he had, his, they he had got his money training in, in, in Spain, Spain and right. he also went to Japan. Yeah, well, he got his training in Spain. But he uh, did not take up arms. That's the difference between him and he Aguinaldo. Didn't, he didn't want he did to separate writing. from Spain. He yeah. wanted to have reform. Reform, but he, he uh, did his writing. Unlike Aguinaldo and Bonifacio, it was independent from Spain. Spain, and so. Uh, resolve is that that's the the trick actually what my brother did is it's supposed to be the history filipino history hmm. abstract history of yeah. uh, filipino okay. so if you look closely at it there's salmon and all mm -hmm. the different types <laughs> of words. that's right yeah you have to really look that's at uh it. professor val ligo yeah and that is on the grounds of Rizal park mm -hmm. beautiful mural and here is the bust of Rizal. jose Rizal. Mm -hmm. They use that place, and I was wondering. Uh, I didn't under. There is a group called Resolve, and it's not the one that started this, but they have taken. They they have to have events there, but there are. We have. Um, uh, their jazz. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And, yes. uh, and they had a palenque. They had a market. Yeah, they do all also. kinds of people go there. Yeah, there. It's our park, so they have little family gatherings there, BFW. Mm -hmm. the, the, the one thing I have a, a comment about that, it's, it's, it's uh, sloped. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. really hard for the older people well, to, that was to the, go up that hill. That's the only site they could get. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's, that, that's true. I, <laughs> we but, were lucky. a million dollar view. We were lucky to get that. That's right. You're right. million dollar yeah. view. Because okay. remember, the bridge leading <laughs> yeah. to it is called Resolve Bridge. <laughs> but we across can't, the street, We can't complain. Yeah, across the street was Amazon's Main, that's you know, right. The Marine, the Pacific Medical Center. <laughs> yeah, right? it was a no, Marine. A it was a Marine that's hospital. Right. And right. Then, that's then, right. It became, then Amazon at mm -hmm. one point. Now it's Pac Med or something like that. It was Pac. Yeah, a lot Pac of Filipino veterans uh, would go up to the veterans' hospital. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. Ah, Bulusan's great site. Yes. Those um, of us who know Carlos Bulusan. That's not so much a gathering Brooks. place. It's um, no. We, I wanted to a, make tribute. You know what it is? It's actually a place where people go to pay tribute mm -hmm. uh -huh. to Carlos. So uh, America is the college. Um, let's see the Department mm -hmm. of Ethnic Studies uh, at the University of Washington. These are some examples of his book. He was also the, I believe, the treasurer, or the, he was a, tre uh, wasn't he a treasurer of the ILWU? ILWU, yeah. yeah. No, he woke the, He had some kind of, of no, he, he was an officer. He was brought here to do, to do that famous final book, oh, the, the history book. of, yeah. The yearbook? The one that we have copies of in the office. Mm. And uh, oh, he was so a writer. Oh, Larry Leon. Yeah. yeah. So Chris Monsalves brought him up. Oh, Chris. And, uh, <clears throat> And he dies here. He, he, he had, had, he had, he had he, TB. He, he died out of Furland. Yeah, well, he, yeah. well, he dies in yeah. Seattle, right? Yeah. TB. Yeah. And he was very young. Um, Furland Sanitarium. Yeah. 
He, the reason why America is in the heart is a very important book. A lot of people have read this because it, it documents the struggles. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They almost think it's semi-autobiographical in that the struggles of the Filipinos leaving their country to come to America. Oh, you yeah. see uh, on the cover, you see the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the land of opportunity and, and, and realizing, you know, the struggle you know, being confronted by struggling, by the discrimination yeah. of, of, uh, of the hate. Uh, uh, but uh, a lot of people get a full uh, uh, understanding of the, the Filipino struggle and, and um, perseverance, right? Resilience, because we're still here. Mm -hmm. We made through it. And he wrote, you know, Laughter of My Father. He mm -hmm. wrote poetry. He was very prolific. Yeah, having having worked in Alaska as a youth and working with the older generation, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he, he documented from yeah. his own experiences and, no, and interviewing he, he other people. He never went. He Ruth. was sick. He wrote the experiences of other people. He was good. Yeah, person. he wrote. Yeah, he, he uh, wrote what he heard. Because mm. I interviewed his brother Aurelio. Oh. And uh, well, he documented them he docu clearly. He was a good listener, having, and he like documented say, what everybody would say. And that what was wonderful because by listening and putting out the stories, he was not telling his one story. He was telling oh, the story God, of yes. many. Yeah, that was yeah. a con oh, it was yeah. a conglomeration of a number many of stories. Boys, and yes. he personalized it so yeah. everybody said, "Oh, he was working in the fields." Oh, he no, the guy had TB. Mm -hmm. I have a letter in the office where he's telling a friend. Uh, we, I can't see you there because I have to go to Furlan. Mm -hmm. But then you can contact me later at Ponce's house, which is up on Beacon Hill. Ponce Torres. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we know then, so we have that he did live here, but he was in and out of, of you know, like you said, he dies at Furlan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. 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 peel up there. He was. So that's I, at Mount Pleasant on Queen Anne. Yeah. Um, I also want to. Note that there is the Carlos Bolosan Memorial exhibit at the Eastern Hotel in Chinatown ID. Well, yes, are. that's right. You're absolutely right. That's right. And Fonz is Yeah. So, Fonz. so uh, here's a quote from, I'll end with this. Here's this Carlos's. I feel like a criminal running away from a crime I did not commit. And the crime is that I am a Filipino in America. <laughs> so on his gravesite, his epitaph is, Here, here lies the tomb of Bulosan. Here, here are also his words, dry as the grass is. You know, we should pay tribute to one person who was really pushed for this. I was there when they dedicated that headstone, mm -hmm. and it was Stan Assis. Ah, Stan who, uh, Assis. Yeah. Stan Assis was very instrumental in making sure uh, that Carlos would uh -huh, have uh -huh. uh, that down. Yeah. somewhere where we could go and visit. And um, I heard it was like abandoned. It was there was grass all over, and nobody taking care well, of it. Well, it was probably one of those things that are flat like on the brick. ground. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was just his name. Uh huh. And. Um, so I remember Fred and I were there the day that it was there, and, and it was Stan, really. I mean, there were other people, but Stan stands Stan out in my sees, mind. And you know, he's an artist. Never forgot until yeah. it was done. Yeah, he's an actor. Yeah. It all kind of falls in line with, with his, you know, Boy. his work. So. <laughs> we have a few questions. Um, so I'm going to start with where I'm going to start. We're going to start with this one. So this one is a very specific question. So I'll do specific, and then we'll we'll zoom out. Um, where was the Visayan bathhouse, and what was it called? It was one of the questions. The which one? Visayan. Visayan, Visayan. Visayan. bathhouse. Oh, the bathhouse. We just you would call it the bathhouse. I mean, it must have had a name, but uh, we all knew it was the Visayan bathhouse. Maybe if you put up, could you put up the map of the uh, time Yeah, I can tell it was right there. by the alleyway. I sure can. Yeah. Okay. Is there a map there? Yeah, she's got the map okay. of Liberty. Yeah. One second, we'll get that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead 
And the reason I call it Vassain because they, most of the Vassain men would go there because that was There it, it is. On, there it would be on King Street. One. There we go. There you go. It'd be across the street from hmm, let me see, Honey Court. That's yeah, Honey Court is down there, uh, right above the Google. Uh, yeah, King Street. Yeah, it's on number eleven. Is Honey Court. Right? King Street is at the I top end. Yeah, that's Maynard. Oh, there's King. Mm -hmm. So it would have been. Let's see. There's the Alps Hotel. Oh, I see. That Rudy's place was over here. Okay, that's King. Mm -hmm. That's King Street. And then it was further down this way. Over here? Yeah. Was that towards the post office? Uh, the old post yeah, office? Yeah, towards the train station. Train station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was on the north side of the street, and right by the alleyway. So it's that block right by, um, right above, as you're going towards the train stations. Okay. It was there for the longest time. Is it near where the, the, the gate is, the Chinese gate? Yeah, it'd be where the bakery is. Right yes, now. the bakery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? That very same place next door to it was where the first, where Father Okanya had his first place. Oh. Right next door to it. Oh. So that place is very significant. And maybe it was there because Father, Father Okanya's Messiah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Uh, it didn't even occur to me. You know? <laughs> you're in. I think your intuition is serving. Well, you. you know, maybe he went down there to visit the guys, tell them come to church. Oh, and they didn't, oh, so we brought church. Well, that's what he told me. I mean, oh, father, boy. okay, this is Father O'Connor, and but he's here with the story of the Seattle Times in 1970, a Spanish American, and he isn't. But he did um, work with the, the. He's not Spanish. No, no, he did work. We were, he's, where, he's was he, where was he? Where was he ordained? Pardon me. Where was he ordained? In the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, he was very charismatic, mm -hmm, he was. and um, he he died saying the rosary. Yeah, he was saying the rosary when he died. He died kneeling down, yeah. crying. Yeah, Saint Alphonsus Church. Hey. Yeah, whatever. Well, I mean, he was amazing. All this, whatever, with all this backstory. Whatever rose your boat. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it didn't even occur to me. Those, that must have been the people you're trying to get to go to church. Exactly. <laughs> so what he, else? What so other? He set up what, an office right what, next what door. <laughs> yeah. What other kinds of things could you do in a bathhouse? Right next door. <laughs> Pretty close to it. So, our, our, we have two more questions. Our next question is how does the Tagalog and Ilocano culture differ and the kind of comment that follows that is I thought that Tagalog people were often in a higher economic cl class and what it's two part and what were some of the reasons that Filipino people moved to this part of the country specifically Seattle my father came here in 1929 he was 18 and that's the boat the Empress of Asia mm -hmm. was departed from Manila and it came directly to Victoria. So it was the boat lanes, and he was contracted, labor contractors went to the field because, you know, uh, labor had been closed. They didn't allow the Chinese or the Japanese, right? Anti-exclusion act. Mm -hmm. And they brought in the Filipinos. We were colonial, we were mm -hmm. nationals. Mm -hmm. They needed labor. Most of the contractors though were doing that for Hawaii. Well, Not so much for them. Or to go to Hawaii or to, no, go, to go to the States. To I do believe where? so. To work where? Just everywhere. Really? No, he wanted. That's, so it, if you okay, look at the ship's mm -hmm. manifest, right. okay, and, and we've done a lot of that where you look at it, mm -hmm. you see what the, uh, especially in the 20s and 30s, coming through the Seattle area, all you see is students, 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 students. Mm -hmm. their, their main intent was to go to school, mm. whether it was to finish mm, high school, mm, mm. Uh, grade school even. Some of them came, hadn't even finished grade school. Mm. And so in the city of Seattle, there were two schools that had special English classes oh, really? for Filipinos who were going to go on to school to UW or go to any of the other classes. And um, that was, one was Franklin, the other one was the old Broadway. Mm -hmm. And um, that was so their English could come up 
to a level where they could communicate. Though they did speak English and they could read, actually their spelling and things were really quite good. So it depended on, um, the, the reason they were coming, you had the pensionados who came early, you know, the, the, the students who were being, um, 1903. Uh, yeah, they were hand-picked people who were going to go to college, then return to the Philippines to develop right. a democratic society. And so um, they got good jobs once they were finished in mm -hmm. industry or uh, education, you know, government, whatever. And I think what a lot of people forget is that the teachers in the Philippines after the United States took over in the very beginning, they were Americans for America. They were teach. That's how they learn English. And, and, uh, another facet of yeah. that is, is it depends on where you came from in the Philippines. Yeah. And the most of the individuals from my dad's generation, my dad got here in 1916. Mm. And most of the individual f from that era landed on the West Coast and then either stayed in California or they moved north and that's how my dad he ran into some individuals who had uh, worked in Alaskan salmon canneries he had heard from them go up to Seattle and you can get to Alaska mm -hmm. and make some money yeah and he followed their advice mm -hmm. and that's how he settled here and a lot of the Ilocano speakers also uh, went east of the mountains yeah. And they were, became farm workers there. Mm -hmm. But my dad worked on a farm in the Philippines taking care of Carabaos in the 19, early 1900s. And uh, he was fortunately uh, given employment as a houseboy for the teacher that was assigned to his, to Santa Maria. And that teacher hired my dad as a houseboy to learn the language, Ilocano, and to show him the traditions. Mr. Uh, Mr. Simpson, Mr. Stimson, yes. And my dad worked for him for three years. And he, when he came here, he immediately saw the market for more Filipinos coming here to work in Alaska and then settling in Seattle. That's where his, that's where his main thrust was, and he got family members, relatives, and you know the, you know the Filipino, yeah, the yeah. Philip, the, the extended same. family. Yeah, it was extended the same. Extended family. Yeah. We got the Dellas, mm -hmm. Assis. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. it's incredible. I've got God, relatives. Well, that's the same way it was my dad. Uh, my 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 father came when. He left the Philippines when he was 18, but by the time he got here, he turned 19, okay? And um, he came with two cousins. You yeah, see, it, your dad, your dad, well, you've got, the, I've got that picture of your brother and yeah. your mom, and he, she was asking for my dad's... Well, uh, uh, what, what happened was, um, my mother and dad didn't meet, my father comes in 1919, my mother in 1928. Yeah. So, oh. but my father uh, was supposed to go to Chicago. He had a cousin who was going uh, studying medicine in Chicago. He, first, he had gone to Stanford, and then we were mm. cracking his thing. Yeah. Then he went to uh, Chicago. Anyway, on the ship's manifest, it says all the cousins. Yeah. It's a student, and their destination was Chicago. Well, apparently, it took three three weeks to come. And how are you going to go to UW if the person who was going to help you is in Chicago? Mm. So that's right. They and I didn't learn this till much later when the cousin told me this. My dad they made a pact then that my father would work and he put his cousin through UW. I didn't know that because my father was killed when I was four, and we met this man thirty years later. And Fred did research at UW. Sure enough, in the the. Uh, I had the students at UW when they do Filipino history months to do pictures. Mm -hmm. I found my uncle Pablo uh, sitting on with a, a other Filipino students sitting on logs on the UW campus, so you, it was brand new. And then later on, you know, the pictures of the the Filipino club. He got his master, a bachelor's and then his master's, and went on. My father then, because he was working, he became 
a contractor like your dad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he did it. And then he sold insurance. He, we had a restaurant, we had a grocery store. Yeah. But what he did, he had to do all those things because like your dad, he was supporting family. He was bringing from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And not only men working, he had all his female relatives that he brought here. Huh. And uh, I mean, it, the story of Filipinos is different, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, but, and, but and they, there is the, no one story. The question is about Tagalog. Tagalog, right? the Tagalogs. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's, the, there's one more question after this one. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I think my understanding is because Manila, the capital, is the Tagalog-speaking area. Mm -hmm. Is am I correct? Yeah, because you know at the, the rural time, people were the Ilocanos, the Ilocanos. and, and yes. I think it started about the time when the Philippines becomes okay. 1934, the status of the Philippines and and Filipinos changes. Um, they're going to get their independence in ten years, and or eleven years. Mm. Filipinos are no longer yeah. American nationals; they're now aliens. Mm. Overnight. Oh God! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh then yeah. The Philippines Jesus. is no longer a colony; right. it's now a Commonwealth. Oh, God. And, and then the, 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 the seat of the, the Commonwealth is Manila, Ch where all the Tagalog speakers are. Changing, and, and so changing, it had the, the high, yeah. higher legislator status. Legislators did. Yeah. Legislature, they tried to change the wording of a, of a, of a, a law to include alien Filipinos because they were designated as aliens, tried to include them in individuals, as individuals who were illegally, could not, could not own land in the state of Washington. Well, I'm, I'm trying to connect the Tagalog, so Tagalog, Filipino is the national language, and I think it was because of the fact that the, the capital was well, you, there. You know what was interesting? In the Tagalog-speaking area. But I was doing some reading at the time this was occurring. There were more people speaking Visayan hmm. In the Philippines, than than speaking uh, Tagalog or Ilocano, but and yet it was but a seat of government, yeah. Yeah. And, and so that, and it didn't it didn't happen overnight. Like thirty four, the Commonwealth is set up, and that's when your dad starts that Commonwealth Club, that famous picture oh, we have. Yeah. Okay, that's what happens. All yeah. every time there was a significant <laughs> thing that that's happened right. in the Philippines, Club. the people, the Filipinos in the United States, they celebrated it. Yeah. So the. Philippines become the Commonwealth. Your dad has a Commonwealth Club. Well, I've got yeah. two Ilocanos here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm and Pakistani. And, and, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh for Christ's sake! <laughs> and, and then, and then, when the Philippines <laughs> becomes, uh, when the Philippines gains independence in uh, uh, July Fourth, nineteen forty-six, then all the Filipino communities throughout the country then have this great big to do, and it, you know we, yeah. we celebrated July Fourth for the longest time. That's right. Until. Yeah. The president of the Philippines goes to Congress and tries to get money to build up his country, which was destroyed. Is this Quezon? No, Man it was Quezon? Uh, Macapagal. Ma 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 yeah, and Congress turns him down. This was the country that had fought on the side of, of America and was still demolished in the 60s. He went back and they went back and they declared Ma they would yeah. now de the what, what did now the holiday, June 12th, which is the day that was declared independence by the people, the people who revolted against Spain. Right. Come on, give me a break. But you know, you know, one more, another question. Wait, one more question. Um, and I want to acknowledge, Marky, your question I will share with Dorothy directly. Um, it's a specific question for you, but I want to acknowledge the. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I want to acknowledge the question that came through our YouTube chat, and I, I really like this one. Um, what is the biggest distinction between now and during your time in terms of Seattle's Filipino community? And what recommend or what do you think was Seattle's Filipino community? And what what do you suggest in terms of improving the Filipino community right now? Ooh, that's a biggie. <laughs> that is a biggie. What, like, what, do you mean, what do you mean by, improve. I'd like to know what they mean what by they want? improve? If you don't, I, um, that's just what, it, it's open-ended, open to your interpretation, I think. <laughs> so it's a two-part. Maybe you just answer I, the first part. Um, what big differences between you. now and, <laughs> and the before times? Uh, what I've heard in Someone who grew up here, and I was lucky, my parents spoke the same language so I I had the ear for the language and picked it up easily um, when I meet Filipinos coming from the Philippines this may or may not relate but they don't think I'm Filipino because I don't speak Tagalog 
you know, there are 120, is it 123 languages in the Philippines? <laughs> and just because you, you don't speak Tagalog, you're yeah. not Filipino. And I think we are, we, I am a Filipino. Well, we're kind, of, we're kind of schizophrenic because when I was growing up, because I was born in the United States, yeah, and my mother were, and father knew that since I was born in the United States, I'm an American. Mm. So <laughs> people would ask me, what are you, little girl? I said, I'm an American. No, you're not, because I didn't look like they did. That's right. So then yeah, the new yeah. Filipinos are coming after World War II. Mm. And they would, of course, that's the whole Tagalog thing. I'm not Filipino because I don't speak Tagalog. So what the heck? Part of what were we? We become Filipino Americans. I mean, that's exactly what we are. Mm. Our ancestral land is the Philippines, and we're proud of it. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, people like us, we we push Filipinoness all the time, but we're not accepted full time as Filipinos. Right. By many Filipinos. I don't think they get that part. No, and, and you know, yeah. when I went to the, I went to the Philippines finally when I was sixty-two years old, and I was called a Cano. Oh, Cano. Yeah, oh, cano. which is Americano. Oh, Cano. Ah. And are you okay? I got ten. So oh. I I don't know. Even among ourselves, I don't know if that's that answer. A lot of times, we're not Filipino enough with some people, and, and yet that's all we are. We, we've retained through our parents, through yeah. our community, uh, aspects of Filipinoness. I think, yeah. at least for me, you know, Catholicism is a big deal, which is, yeah. I think, very Filipino. But I think the fact in where we, Auntie Dorothy, through Auntie Dorothy, I've learned about Filipino American history, yeah. and so, and I'm proud of that. But I also pay tribute to the ho the homeland. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting, you know, when we were teaching uh, Filipino American history and culture, we would spend at least two weeks talking about the Philippines because we are. We, we're different from other people in many ways because we still carry a lot of the traits through our parents. Mm -hmm. We eat Filipino food. We have Filipino traditions. We have shoots. I used to well, we're, Filipino we're lucky dancing. because we're second generation. I'm so second our, generation. Yeah, I'm second generation yeah, too. Right. So our we had our prime resource, yeah. our parents. We, our parents were immigrants. Exactly. Yeah. So my kids are less Filipino than I am. But here's a funny thing. My a lot of third generation Filipinos, when their grandparents, now they're Lolo and Lola. Mm. I mean, <laughs> how Grand, Filipino can you be? And grandfather. I mean, uh, yeah. you're not Lola, are you? I am. Oh, you I are? Have five. <laughs> I have five grandchildren. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm grandma. I'm Matanda. <laughs> I'm old. I'm older than I look. Yeah, but I'm very. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm an no. oldie too. <laughs> So when my daughter became Lola, my youngest daughter, I thought, wow, you know, that's Grand, cool. I think that's, and my son, Anthony, yes. he's Lola. And I think that's the role of we second generation is yeah. don't forget that you are yeah. Filipino. My mother said that don't forget you're Filipino. You may be the only brown person in the room, but remember you're Filipino. And I, I, I my kids have married Caucasians. Yeah. I and are out of Filipino, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of us have married outside our our Filipino mm -hmm. group. But we remember, and we want to also continue our Filipino ness. Don't forget that you're. And luckily, my mother's still alive to, you know, to <laughs> to you know to impose yeah. that. So. Uh, take advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, when you say improve, take advantage of every educational opportunity that that comes up. This is this doesn't mean that our Filipinoness, our community, needs improvement. But look at it as an individual, and see what you can contribute back to the community as a result of your you what you learn in education and bring the next generation along and the next generation after that and uh that's and but maintain your language mm -hmm. whatever you do maintain your language but learn english as well and other language mm -hmm. that's my that's okay which language <laughs>
I, I want to. <laughs> Arabic is a good one. Yeah. Arabic, Mandarin. That's oh, a good you're one. talking to Jana, uh, generally. Yeah, Spanish. That's a good right. one. Just we are we are ten minutes over because I wanted you all to answer the questions because they were so good. So I'm gonna just close this out. I know some of our folks had to leave. Um, you've been getting a lot of love in the chat. I will send you the great comments that we're hearing from folks. Um, and Dorothy, I will share the specific question with you that was directed towards you and contact information for you to follow up. But um, if you have any parting words, now is our time to wave to our folks before I close the meeting. Um, thank you so much, Ellen. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, Historic Seattle, for doing yes, this. Oh, thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank yeah, you for, I for us was pushing the envelope. Taylor. Yeah, I mean, it went by so quick. And I think it's, it's very important for the audience to know that, yes, we have some historic places oh, yeah. in Seattle, and you should go visit them. And, and it's very important that you learn about us yeah and you can do that through these 10 13 places we did yeah. 13. 13 places that we've done yeah wow. some some were weekend places some were everyday places auntie dorothy's house was also a very historic <laughs> gathering place so many decisions they had the drill team hanging out there <laughs> yeah yeah you know that the original structure of my dad's place i think i might have shared this with both of you yeah the original structure is gone it's totally gone but i'm thinking of uh getting a you did it for, i don't know how that plaque got on the sidewalk next to uh and say this is a historic landmark this this place that's changed and uh but uh, this is a historic landmark with respect to the Filipino, the growth of the Filipino mm -hmm. community in Seattle, and have that put in the sidewalk right in front of the place. Oh, same with the Washington State Supreme Court decision. Yeah, the Washington yeah. State Supreme Court decision. I mean, geez. Uh, at any rate. Hey, well, thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone, audience. for joining us. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming back for part two. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> and <Thank> I will. <laughs> I will send the follow-up email as always to everyone who was registered. And I'll also include all of the books and links and information in the description on the website. That way you can share that link with everyone and have a great rest of your evening, everyone. You know, uh, historic land, uh, landmark for Seattle is Garfield High School for Filipinos. <laughs> oh. Yeah, hey. that's right. Yeah, a lot of Filipinos yeah. went there. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Bye. Bye.